So if you put all these trends together, the social network and, uh, and the mobile network, what, what you see is, is an extraordinary big data explosion, right? Big data is everywhere. Uh, exabytes and exabytes of data being created by telemetry, by GPS chips, by RFID chips, by, by Twitters and tweets and SMSs, by, uh, by um, all manner of photo and video being uploaded. And uh, I, I think I'm fortunate to have lived through this. You know, in the early 90s, uh, the largest business intelligence databases in the world by the richest, the richest 20 companies on earth might have had 200 gigabytes sitting in their systems. You know, I, I remember, like 93, we're working on 200 gigabyte databases for the largest companies on the face of the earth, and we thought that was a lot of data. Today, uh, the kids in your neighborhood update, uh, up, uh, upload 200 gigabytes of data to YouTube probably every few days. Um, what a difference you know, 20 years makes. If we look at the rate at which this, uh, this data is accumulating, it's going, it's going so fast that I think some people just uh, have a hard time getting their hands around it. I think I saw a statistic the other day suggesting that we're collecting as much data in the past two years as we collected from the beginning of time to the year 2003. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Now, when I used to describe to people what we do, um, they didn't always get it, and I would say, well, let me give you an example. You know, we, can, we actually built a software product that will look at 10 billion keystrokes and we don't just look at the keystroke, we look at the sequence and the frequency of the keystrokes, and we look for a pattern. And it turns out, if we can find a cashier in a supermarket that actually hit the keystroke pattern, refund $9.95, refund $9.95, refund $9.95, and I did that six times in a row in 60 seconds, that, that's a pattern that's naturally occurring in the universe about once in a billion times, maybe once in a trillion times. Almost never happens. If we see it happen twice on the same aisle with the same cashier, it's a pattern that occurs all the time if they're stealing from you. And if they know that your uh, manager has to approve anything more than $10 is a refund. And so one of, the, one of the interesting nuances in the intelligence industry is you just look for something that probably shouldn't occur and you compare it, you compare the, the, the incidence of occurrence to what you would predict in your model and what pops out is an interesting insight. And of course, when you apply that across fraud detection or across every possible industry, you see there are millions of insights. They all come out of big data. The more data there is, the more insights there are. And they have potential to, to upend every part of the economy. We've always been focused on big data. We were, the, we were the biggest data business intelligence company in 1993. That's why we got in the industry. Every year for a decade, I think we were anointed by the business intelligence report you know, as the leader in big data. Uh, the only thing that's changed now is we just realized the big data just got 100 times bigger, and so we have to go harder. And, uh, and as we look at the impact of mobile intelligence, we knew that would drive a lot more data. We looked at social intelligence, even more data still. And now what we realize is that it's very likely that we'll see systems that used to be going out to a few thousand users and getting 10 queries a day and where people are willing to wait 10 seconds for the answer, those systems are gonna go out to millions of users and they're gonna run 100 queries a day and they'll wait one second for the answer. So the power output of these systems is going to have to dramatically improve. And so in the past two years, we've been focused upon performance and power engineering. If you look at this chart, this shows the kilocycle output of a typical microstrategy test configuration. Kilocycles is our benchmark for, uh, it's 1,000 reports an hour. So at, uh, at 25 kilocycles, you get 25,000 reports an hour out of a typical setup. Uh, you can see that between uh, 2010, 2011, we pushed that typical power output from about 28 uh, kilocycles all the way up to 175 kilocycles. In fact, we've, we've incorporated in the DNA of the company power engineering, and now every time we build a piece of software, we're always assessing uh, the power output of the software versus a given uh, unit of hardware. You can't have too much, that's pretty clear. 
And in, in a world where the customer and the executive is the user, on an iPad, they expect sub-second performance because their bogey or their benchmark is how fast can I turn a sheet of paper? They are not paid to wait for the answer to come back. And I, I illustrated this point to a bunch of people that worked for me the other day, and I said, when's the last time you talked to a rich, powerful, influential person and you waited 13 seconds before you answered each of their questions? And I said, how long do you think the conversation would last? Someone goes, well, maybe 14 seconds. No one's going to wait. Your customer's not going to wait. And we realize that. And so it's incredibly important for us to drive this. And our, our solution to driving power is, is twofold. One is everything we can possibly do in order, in order to drive uh, software effectiveness within the software itself, within the four corners of the software. And that's what, that's what the kilocycle benchmark was meant to do. But the second thing we realized is there's no way we're going to achieve enough power. We're not going to achieve exponentially increasing scalability unless we start to embrace this last trend, which we refer to as the cloud. Uh, I mean, cloud is, in essence, virtualized, you know, infinitely scalable power across as much hardware as you can find that, that's going to flex elastically up and down. And uh, I, I, think, I think the mobile trend and the big da data trend and, and our awareness of what's going on in social networks were the tipping points, and it caused us to, to realize that now is the time for us to introduce a cloud offering to our customer base that's optimized for microstrategy applications. If you look at the consumer cloud, we're all familiar with Facebook and YouTube and, and, and Twitter, and Flickr. The significance of a consumer cloud is a 16-year-old girl can walk through a town square in Egypt. She can take out her smartphone, take a photo of soldiers beating up on someone. She can upload it to Facebook or Twitter it. It gets retweeted 10 times. It gets retweeted 25,000 times. It gets shared 14 million times. And it ends up on 198,000 servers across 82 countries. It might be running on $27 million of hardware within 48 hours. And there wasn't any government that endorsed that, and she didn't make an application, and no company made a decision. It was a completely organic, virtual, viral process, wh whereby the interaction of the people in the cloud determined how the CPU power and how the storage was going to be allocated. And that is really the brilliance. It's really the brilliance of YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, that they spread those things so rapidly and virtually and flexibly. And, and the genius of the cloud is that 16-year-old girl that probably doesn't have $9 in her pocket managed to get her hands on $27 million of hardware because her message was an interesting message and her program was an interesting program. Right? Not centrally, hierarchically controlled programming, which is the past, but organically, virtually elastic programming. That's the future. And that is the cloud. Well. What we're doing at MicroStrategy is focused upon how do we bring that same elasticity in the cloud to all sorts of intelligence applications and all the business applications that our customers are going to want to deploy. Right? Simply put, if you take this entire software platform and you put it in the cloud, it becomes quicker. I, I can do everything 10 times faster or 100 times faster. It becomes higher performance and it becomes cheaper. So properly, properly implemented, there really isn't a downside to it. We look at the cloud, and for us, the cloud means business intelligence, it means database, and it means ETL. We need to make sure that all of our intelligence uh, software, including its transactional and multimedia capabilities, is available to our users. And then we need to make sure that we've got the, the scalable analytical databases to provide the intelligence. So, so something that's going to be able to scale up to 100 terabytes of raw information and scan through that raw information uh, without necessarily segmenting it. If I, if I want to pluck out the single most important fact out of 18 billion facts and I want to do it in one second, I need a pretty powerful piece of software. And, of course, the, other, the last component of the cloud is we need to be able to move data into and out of it in order to synchronize data centers and make sure that, that, that we're integrated with all of the tens of thousands of corporations that have massive investments. And so when we started to construct our cloud strategy, 
Well, we knew we had the top thing. We have the intelligence software. We started shopping around to figure out how we're going to put together the analytical database and how we're going to put together the, the ETL. And then who's going to tie it all together? So of course, we're drawing on MicroStrategy for the intelligence layer. We've, uh, we've entered into uh, a strategic partnership with Natiza to embed their database appliance into our cloud. And we're very excited about that. We've also entered into a, a, an enterprise licensing agreement with uh, Paracel so that we can actually use their, their software analytical uh, database solution. And we're enthusiastic about that as well. And of course, we've, uh, we've set up a relationship with Informatica. So any of our customers, any application that, that, that wants to run out of our cloud is going to have access to a best of breed uh, set of partners uh, on day one. And we have uh, negotiated uh, relationships with all of these companies so that we can provide this technology on a metered basis. And so we're changing the paradigm. Instead of, instead of creating a long purchasing cycle with sophisticated negotiations and licensing agreements and the legal department and the purchasing department and the CFO involved, we're turning this into a fairly easy pay-as-you-go uh, situation where you can turn on your cloud application with no risk and no capital expenditure in a day in order to figure out whether it's going to work. Now, what do we think our customers are going to do? We think our customers are, are, are going to look to the cloud for hosting strategic applications, tactical opportunities, and existing applications that we consider legacy BI. Uh, if you consider the legacy BI business, that's the most straightforward. Uh, at the point you start to expand your business uh, intelligence uh, operations, if you're at a crossroads and you're trying to figure out whether or not you want to put in place another data center or another chunk of, of hardware capacity, or if you need to bring on the next 50,000 users, or maybe you're just not happy with the performance of your existing situation, then you can look to the cloud and we could take your application, upload it into our cloud, and perhaps we can show you how we can get the response time from 15 seconds to one second, or from 30 seconds to two seconds. And so we think that's an exciting thing because certainly you're not going to want to spend another year doing it yourself. And if we spend all the time and put in place the, the hundreds of people and the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure necessary uh, to provide a framework for all of our customers to do this on, then we feel like we'll be a, a fairly quick one-stop shop. And, uh, and it's a good service to offer. It's kind of a no-brainer to do this. But this is not really the thing that we, we expect is, is going to be most interesting to our customers. We think even more interesting than porting existing legacy applications into the cloud is going to be all the departmental solutions. Because if, if I want to deploy to 50,000 people and it's going to cost me $10 million of capital, and uh, 20 or 30 full-time people uh, to do it, I probably got to construct a $100 million business case. And there aren't many people that actually want to construct a $100 million business case and bet their career on it. So we see a, a ton of applications, like departmental applications, where they're probably worth two, three, four, five million dollars to a company, but uh, no one can construct a business case enough to risk uh, large sums of money. And so there are great candidates for going into the cloud Anything that's tactical, anything that's departmental, anything that's quick and dirty, or anything that is quick and dirty now but may actually scale up by a factor of 10 or 100 in time, we think that those are great candidates to go into the cloud. If you're not willing to bet $100 million on the application, that doesn't mean there isn't an application. In fact, uh, you know, common sense in the law of elasticity suggests that for every large-scale enterprise application that gets pursued, there are probably 10 that get discarded because they just can't get over the cost of capital hurdle or, or the risk hurdle or they can't establish a business case within the corporation. So we're out there uh, with our arms open, uh, willing to provide our cloud infrastructure uh, to support each of those departments. You might not have $10 million in capital or, or, or time to spend on the problem, but if you have four weeks and four people and you want to try it out, we're going to be here for you. And we think that's, that's a good thing for us. We think it's a good thing for the ecosystem. It's a great thing for our customers and our partners. Well, finally, I think the most interesting use of the cloud 
is going to be strategic applications. If we come back to that, that uh, retailer, if you are staring down the barrel of a gun and you've got Best Buy coming at you, sorry, if you've got Amazon coming at you and you are Best Buy, and you know Amazon's spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to create that software, then how are you going to respond in the next six weeks? Because in order to create a piece of software that runs on a mobile phone that runs against 50 terabytes that's integrated into social networks or public networks or cloud networks, you're going to have to put up 100 people and spend two years and perhaps risk 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 million dollars. And in those two years time frame, there's no guarantee that Amazon's going to stand still. They're probably going to move. And so if you have a strategic problem, if your business is getting a billion dollars ripped off the top line every year, or if you're looking at your newspaper or magazine being driven out of business because you can't compete with Google or you can't keep up with uh, an Apple, right? We're going to provide our cloud infrastructure with our, with our 100 terabyte database capability with our mobile software as, uh, as an alternative for you. If you want to convert your newspaper into a company that sells digital advertising and run a 50 terabyte clickstream database so as to carve up that inventory, we can actually provide the infrastructure for you to do that in a matter of weeks, uh, not a matter of years. And, and so the promise to a company in that situation is that we've got the capital and we've also got the expertise. You're going to inherit a hundred of our people running the cloud. You're going to inherit hundred million dollars worth of hardware that you can take advantage of. You're going to inherit licenses that would have taken you uh, a year or more to negotiate and you can get up and running and you can focus upon the, the, the matter at hand, right? So in a nutshell, if you take your application in the cloud, I think we can do in weeks what would take years if you were going to do it on your own premise. And there are just lots of applications that won't last uh, if you wait years. You're not going to be in business. The marketplace is moving too rapidly. You don't want to be uh, blockbustered out of existence, which is what happens if Netflix comes along. You can see this last uh, slide I've got just shows all the business processes when you, when you try to come up with an approval for a 10 or 20 or $50 million project, you've got to engage so many different departments in a corporation. Uh, we view one of, the, one of the strengths of the cloud is not just that it's technically more efficient. One of the, one of the insights of using a cloud uh, with our partners is that it's just more efficient from a business process point of view. Because the fact that your legal department was involved for six months and your purchasing department was involved for six months and your finance department was involved in six months in the process of you deciding that you wanted to spend 10 million on hardware and deploy a big application, right? They didn't add any value at all, right? Your customer could care less that your purchasing department and your legal department was engaged heavily in the process by which you obtain the capital to actually deploy an application to provide them value. What the customer wants is they want the application tomorrow and they want it to run fast. They don't care about your lawyers, your purchasing agents, and your financiers. So the real challenge of these large enterprises is there are a lot of people in large enterprises and governments that have nothing to do with software or software networks. If your organization is, is, uh, is existing and if your organization is depending upon the backbreaking labor of purchasing agents and lawyers and financial analysts, the likelihood that you're going to compete successfully with Google or Apple or Amazon is pretty damn low. In fact, next to zero, right? And that's why those companies are, are exploding in value. And that's why the stock market puts such an emphasis on software networks plays like those companies or Twitter or Zynga and why it's so down upon traditional uh, legacy hardware companies right now. We, we just think that the, the time has come to move much faster. I want to thank you for your time.